make the most high your shelter. No evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Verse number nine says, if you will make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will come near you. The writer goes on to say that one of the functions of angels is to watch over believers. There are examples of guardian angels in scripture. We are not to worry about angels. We're not to worship them or become preoccupied with them. They are God's servants. It is comforting to know that God and his servants watch over us even in times of great stress and fear. With this world in the shape that it is in, it is comforting to know that God is right here with us and that his angels are watching over us all night and all day. And we just thank God and praise God that he's right here and for allowing us to see another Thanksgiving, a day before Thanksgiving, his angels are watching over us. Help us sing, please. Jesus. 
Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Bible study. God has blessed us again. We are at a remote location and we are honoring God still the same. We know everybody's enjoying their families on tonight and we approve of that and we thank God for the privilege to enjoy family time, friend time, and a whole lot of eating time. Tonight we're going to focus on 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 4 and 5. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 in the New Testament is where our Bible study will come on tonight. We are focusing on this Thanksgiving season. So we want to see what Paul really has to say to Timothy and say to us about this season and about eating and about what we ought to be doing unto the Lord. We want to point out three things here tonight that Paul says uh, during these trying times. And we live and trying times, but Paul says that we ought to make sure that we do these three things during these, these trying times. First Timothy chapter four, verses four through five. When you found it, you will find these words. For every creature is, every creature of God is good. For every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be refused if, if it is to be received with thanksgiving. If it is to be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. I want to say happy thanksgiving. Happy thanksgiving. The apostle Paul pens this letter to Timothy. And he tells Timothy that I know the last days or the latter times are coming. And let me advise you tonight, we are in those latter times. We're in times where, where men are more conscious of themselves than they are of God. Matter of fact, they like themselves more than they like God. Matter of fact, men are at the point in their lives where they think more of themselves than they think of God. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, perilous times will come. The latter days will bring with it some challenges. The report is every single day, not every single week, every single day, if it's not a mass shooting, there is a shooting somewhere or a killing somewhere or somebody threatening someone to kill. Lives are being taken senselessly because we're in these last days. And in these last days, we need to understand real well that God is still present. God is yet on the throne. God is yet doing the things that he do well, he does well, and that is blessing the people of God in the midst of it. It is so sad. It is so terrible. Every day we hear bad news. And it's one moment of bad news after the other. Paul predicts this day. We predicts this season, that this season will come. Paul says there will be a great falling away from the faith. It is called apostasy. Apostasy. A-P-O-S-T-A-S-Y. Apostasy. This word apostasy means that people will no longer have the faith in God that we once had. This word apostasy means that people will fall away from God, fall away from church, fall away from good preaching. And I want to say on this Thanksgiving season, on this Thanksgiving Day Eve, that people are falling away from the faith. And they're not doing it one, two, three people at a time. People are falling away in groves. Even churchgoers are falling away from the faith of God or their faith in God. The Apostle Paul predicts this to his 
son in the ministry, Timothy. When you look at verses one through three, the apostle Paul says, now the spirit of God, now the spirit speaks expressly. The spirit of God speaks clearly. And the spirit says, God's Holy Spirit says, that in the latter days or in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith. Some will depart from the faith. Some will leave the faith. And we can see it day after day after day after day. People will do anything to avoid walking in faith in the faith of the Lord. <clears throat> we walk in everything else. We walk and do everything else. But when it comes to walking in the faith, trusting God, when it comes to walking in the faith, serving God, when it comes to walking in the faith, assembling in the presence of God, the spirit says, and the spirit is always right. The spirit says that people will depart from the faith. They will leave it. People that were taught good Bible principles will walk away from them. People who were taught the right principles of God will just walk away and leave them. I dare tell you, we are in these latter days. And you can testify tonight that men will walk away from God and shake their fist at God and tell God how mad they are with God because God didn't do something that they asked God to do. The Apostle Paul says, Timothy, beware. Timothy, be advised. Timothy, whatever you do, understand that the Spirit of God is speaking expressly and this Spirit of God, God himself, says that there will come a day where people will walk away from the faith. He says, take heed to deceiving spirits, the doctrine of the doctrines of the devils, the doctrines of the demons. Paul says to Timothy, the day is coming to coming, Timothy, and I say to you today, that day is here where people will be deceived by deceiving spirits. They will be deceived by evil spirits. They will be deceived by ungodly spirits. And they will follow the doctrines of the demons, the doctrines of the devil. They will be speaking lies in hypocrisy. You know, you don't have to really say things to be a lie. You can deceive one and be a liar. You can spread words and be a liar. You can drop seeds. You can plant seeds in the mind of other people. And that's lying too. You can pose as a born again, believe in Jesus Christ. You can pose as one who is following the principles of God. And then you choose to drop seeds of discourse. That's hypocrisy. That is being a liar. So Paul, Paul says to Timothy in verse two, he says, these who will follow deceiving spirits, they will speak lies in hypocrisy. They will follow the doctrines of the devil. They will follow the doctrines of demons. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In other words, they will get to a point in their lives where they won't even understand and won't even want to understand the real principles of God because the devil has taken over their mind. They have no consciousness of God. They have given themselves to the devil in such a way that they just have gotten to a point in their lives that they rather believe a lie than the truth. My four parents would say it like this. A lie will run a mile before the truth put his shoes on. People would much rather communicate a lie than the truth. People would much rather believe a lie than the truth. I'm talking about happy Thanksgiving. 
But we cannot ignore the fact that the devil is still on the rampage. Innocent lives being killed. Innocent lives being zapped away. People leaving home, people sending their children away from home and they never return home again. The devil is on a rampage. And we as Christians cannot play games with Christianity. We have to get to a point where we sacrifice for God. We have to get to a point where we put our selfish needs behind us. We have to get to a point where our own personal desires fall under God's desires. The Bible says that God wished that no man should perish. God wished that all his dream, his hope is that all will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is our responsibility to make sure that God's dream comes true. We ought to be about God's business and not about the business of the demons. But you know, when the devil has one's mind, he or she cannot even see down the road. They can't see the forest for the trees. They cannot even see the truth and the truth is staring right at them because their minds are seared because the devil has taken over and has control in these last evil days. Mm -hmm. He says their minds are seared. He says that they, they are caught up in lies and caught up in hypo hypocrisy. They are even forbidding to marry. When Paul says that they are forbidding to marry, he goes on to talk about how they are abstaining from food, he talks about how they have created their own little ritual. And because they've created their own little ritual, they are imposing their will upon others. You know, you marry who you want and you're right. You go where you want to go, you're grown, you're right. But every decision we make mm -hmm. comes with a consequence. Mm -hmm. He says they are they are forbidding to marry. They have come up with a reason why we should not get married. Well, we got some things on the block now that we call marriage that's not marriage. We got some things on the block now that people have come to the conclusion just because we share the same domicile, we're married. Just because we've been with each other a long time, we're married. It is so easy for somebody to call a person their husband or call that person their wives and they haven't gotten a license, they haven't been before a judge, they haven't been before the preacher and they have no documentation of their marriage, but they're willing to call each other spouses. It's because we, like those that Paul talks about, have come up with our own little agenda, our own little rules and regulations. We've come up with our own little structure. Let me show you tonight, if it's not God's structure, it's the structure of the devil. If it's not what God has said to do, then it is of the devil. Amen. If it's not what God has appointed us to do, it is satanic. It is not of God. So they have, they've come to the con conclusion that we're going to forbid people to marry. We're going to forbid them to marry. Yes, there are some governing rules that we ought to take on before we get married. We ought to go to premarital counseling. We ought to make sure we choose a man and a woman to marry. We ought to make sure that we do the things that are proper according to God's word to marry, but we should not develop rituals. And this is what Paul is talking about. They developed their own little rituals around marriage, so they forbidden people to marry. He goes on to say, they commanded people to abstain from food. Some forbid it people to abstain from certain meats, which God created 
to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. You see, when we believe and we know the truth, we understand in, in Genesis chapter 1, all the way from verses 1 to verse 31, in Genesis chapter 1, God says it is good. When he got to finish making man, it, it became very good. Mm -hmm. And because God has created these things, then they are good. In other words, you may not eat pork because of your high blood pressure. You may not eat beef because of what it does to your body. You may not eat chocolate because of what it does to your body. But the fact of the matter is, we ought not create a religious ritual around it. They're telling people this ritual, this ritual of certain foods must be eaten. This ritual of certain foods cannot be eaten. They have created a whole plan around it. That's why we have so many religions. At one time, it was 3,000 religions in the United States alone. Now it's several more than that. But every time somebody create a, a, a ritual around a particular idea, we got a new religion or we got a new doctrine or we have a, a new denomination. So what Paul is saying is, it's okay to abstain from certain foods. Many of us need to abstain from certain foods. Many of us need to shut down certain things. Many of us need to fast more often, but don't create a ritual around it. He says that these people are forbidden, for, forbidding marriage because they created a ritual around it. They created a, a doctrine around it. They created their own little theology. God says it's wrong. Paul says to Timothy, this is wrong. He says, God created to be, God created it all to be received with thanksgiving. It's a bad thing if you receive food without being thankful. By those who believe and those who know the truth, it's all right to eat whatever food you choose to eat, as long as it doesn't make you sick, as long as it does not harm the body, because the body is God's temple and we ought to take care of it. But don't create a religious uh, rule or religious ritual around it and say God told you to. Because Paul, Paul says to Timothy, you got to believe and know that which is true. Then it comes to verses four and five, is, and this is where I hang my hat tonight. I told you at the beginning of the lesson, there will be three things that we talk about tonight. Number one is thanksgiving. Number two is the word of God. And number three is prayer. Look at what he says. He says in verse number four, 1 Timothy chapter four, verse number four, for every creature of God is good. Every creature. Now, I... Beg to differ at times, but the Bible says every creature of God is good. Snakes for me, I draw the line. If I see a snake before the snake see me, he's a dead snake. It doesn't matter if he's a grass snake. It doesn't matter if he's a helpful snake. It doesn't matter if he's a good snake. If I see him before he sees me, he's a dead snake. And if I see him then the fight is on. I'm going to challenge him on the spot. But the Bible says every creature of God is good. Mm -hmm. And we even know that God created the snake, but it was the snake that misled Miss Eve in the garden. It's the snake, Satan himself posing as the snake in the garden is the reason why we have sin in the world today. I just can't handle the snake. Maybe I can't handle the snake because back on four miles, I almost got bit by one. We had this, 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 this washing machine. 
And, and when it gets through spinning, you have to reach down and pull the lever. And once you pull the lever, you dump all the water out of it, run out on the ground or on the floor, and you have a hose anywhere to run out on the ground. I reach down to pull the lever, and once I pull the lever upside the wall, jumped a big nine-foot snake. He jumped on the up the wall because he was trying to bite me. I was stuck in my tracks. I couldn't move because I realized that this snake could have bit me. I even had to call my younger brother to come out and kill him. I was so wiped out. Ever since that day, the fight was on. I don't care if it's a living snake or a dead snake. To me, it's going to be a beaten snake. I visited a woman's house some years later after I was grown, and out the back room come her son with a snake wrapped around his neck. I told her then, I'm gone, and I won't be back to ever visit you again. And to this day, 30 years later, I've kept my word. And then she tells me that the snake went missing. What if that snake had a went missing while I was sitting on that couch? <laughs> but the Bible says... Every creature that God has created is good. Right. So there must be some good snakes. There must be snakes that are good. It just won't be a good snake around me. First Timothy chapter 4 verse number 4 says, For every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be refused. He's talking about food. He's talking about what we eat. Nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. We're, we're in this season where we ought to give thanks. It's a shame if we take on food with God without giving thanks. It's a shame if we open our eyes and don't thank God for another day. It's a shame if we have a good house and don't thank God for it. It's a shame if we have a shotgun shanty. And do not thank God for it. It is a crying shame. We have good jobs. We ought to thank God for it. We have good spouses. We ought to thank God for them. We have people in our lives that have not arrived yet. We still ought to be thankful unto God because God has done great things to us. Amen. He woke us up one more again. Right. He's given us one more chance. And for that, we ought to be thankful. So my first thing is, we ought to be thankful to God. We ought to have a Thanksgiving, hallelujah, good time. Even if we can't spend Thanksgiving with the one that we love, we ought to be thankful to God because God is the one who loves us. Amen. We ought to say, God, I thank you. Don't be so mean to say, Lord, I thank you that I woke up. I thank you for my children. I Thank you for my spouse. I thank you for my friends. I thank you for my home. home. Lord, I thank you for my ride, even if it's a hoopta. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for metro tickets. I thank you that I can ride the bus. Lord, I thank you that you kept me safe. And let me tell you, you need to thank God for keeping you safe because danger is lurking. Every single day, danger is is present. Yes. So we ought to be thankful. We ought to give God thanksgiving. We ought to celebrate what God is doing around us. We ought to be thankful to God. Some people think Thanksgiving is about chicken, turkey, dressing, pies, cakes, family and friends, but we ought to create an atmosphere throughout the whole year of Thanksgiving, thanking the God in heaven for giving us whatever we have. Even in our sickness, we ought to thank God. Mm -hmm. Even in our trials and tribulations, we ought to be thankful unto God. For God is good. His mercy endures forever. He is good forever and ever, even when he doesn't give me what I want. We ought to be thankful. Therefore, we ought to be giving God thanks in everything. Paul says, rejoice in all things and give God thanks in all things. 
So he says to Timothy today, he says, Timothy, don't ref refuse things that God has done for you. He says, Timothy, just take on every day with thanksgiving. So the first thing you are you must observe in verse number four is that you need to have thanksgiving. You need to be thankful. If you're going to shout at all, you ought to shout unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Too many times we shout because of good health. We shout because of money. We shout over new jobs. We ought to shout over the things that are not so tangible. We ought to shout because God is in our lives. We ought to shout because people have come to Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Luke chapter 15, when one come to Christ in heaven, the, the, the heavenly host rejoice. We ought to rejoice over one more soul coming to heaven. And while you're doing your New Year's resolution, you ought to put a target of how many souls you want to come to Christ. How many souls you want to come to Christ because God has used you to get them there? None of us can save souls, but all of us can present the gospel. There ought to be a target in your mind. There ought to be a number in your mind. Lord, bless me this year. And you should not wait to next year to have this new found revolution, a new found revelation. There ought to be a, it ought to be a revolution in your life where your whole life is turned around. You ought to have a, a revolution. It ought to be a, an event where Things just turn in a different way. And not only should you have a, a revolution, it ought to be a part of your New Year's thought pattern. You, you ought to have the desire, the hope. My New Year's commitment is to God reach as many souls for you mm -hmm. as I can. And Lord, I promise you, I'm going to be thankful for it. Lord, use me this year. And don't wait to 2023. Lord, use me this year. These last days, these last few weeks, Lord, use me this year. Because I want to be able to thank you, Lord, for another soul coming to Christ. Mm -hmm. Another person getting in church. Man, do we need to reach people to get back in church? Yeah. Do we need to reach people to get to Christ? If we get people saved, there would not be so much trouble about us. Yes. I'm convinced that the best evangelists and the best missionaries are those who are gangsters today. They can make the best missionaries possible. They can make the best evangelists possible because they will go where church folk won't go. They will present the gospel in such a way that church people will back off and say, let them have it. But we have to be the catalyst by which God will save them. Amen. And in the midst of that salvation story and those people coming to Christ, we ought to be saying, Lord, I thank you. So the first thing that Paul says to Timothy, Paul says to his son in the ministry, have thanksgiving. Receive everything from the Lord in thanksgiving. The second thing he says, the word of God ought to be present in our lives. Verse 5, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 5, the last verse that I will deal with tonight, says, for it is sanctified by the word of God. I used to wonder why people would, would say Bible verse over their food. They said, Lord, bless you. Thank you. Lord, we glorify you for the food. Lord, bless the food in Jesus' name. And then there's their Bible verse. Because the food is sanctified by the word of God. Amen. Our daily activities are sanctified by the word of God. This word sanctified means to be set apart, to be made different. Your day ought to be set apart. Your day ought to be made different. Your day ought to be sanctified with the word of God. The only day that you should not hear, read, speak the word of God is the day that you can't speak, you can't hear, and you can't read. The only day that you should not uh, submerge yourself 
into the word of God is the day that you're not breathing. The only day that you should not have a taste of the word of God is that day that you cannot tell whether you're in the world or not. How much more would people get along if just 98% of us stayed in the word? If 98% of us read the word, if 98% of us studied the word, if 98% of us took heed to the word of God. Paul says to Timothy, he says, Timothy, whatever you do, realize that everything you deal with is sanctified by the word of God. It's not our words that sanctify. It is God's word. When Jesus, in Matthew chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was confronted by the devil, he quoted the devil, the word of God. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get the devil off your back, you need to know the word of God. Mm -hmm. Food is sanctified by the word. Our day is sanctified by the word. Let me tell you, a good dose of the word of God early in the morning will set your day on cloud nine. Mm -hmm. A good dose of the word of God, because the psalmist says that, that I will look to your word early in the morning, God. And we got folk talking about we are not morning people. But God is the one that woke you up to even let you see the morning. At least give him a few minutes in the word of God. Just a few minutes. If you give God a few minutes in the word, it will make a difference in your whole day. So the first thing he says, take everything in thanksgiving. The second thing he says is make sure that you understand that your day, your food, your your day-to-day -day activities are sanctified by the word of God. And he says, by prayer. Paul says to Timothy, during this Thanksgiving season, during a season when all havoc is taking place, during this season when men in these last days are walking away from the faith, the saints of God need to be in prayer. Amen. During this season when people are going to work and not showing up at home ever again, during this season when, when people are missing during this season when there are open seats at the dinner table, we ought to be in prayer. We ought to be talking to God. Asking God, Lord, have mercy. Let me tell you, I don't know about you, but I can't handle too much news these days. Mm. <laughs> I, can't, I can't watch a whole 30-minute broadcast of news anymore. It's just one thing after the other. When they say it's a lot going on, it's a whole heap going on. Instead of watching the news, instead of saturating yourself, because when the news goes off and then it comes on again, it's the same thing that is being pounded in your brain, pounded in your heart, pounded in your head. When you hear it the first time, pray. When you hear the grapevine, pray. When you hear bad news, pray. When you hear good news, pray. It's prayer. Prayer is so important until God speaks to us. Prayer is so important that God wants us to speak to him because prayer is a dialogue. Prayer is God talking to us and prayer is us talking to God. And God speaks to us through his word. God speaks to us when we are thankful. All the way back to verse 1, 1 first, first, first Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he, he says that the Spirit speaks expressively. The Spirit speaks expressively. The Spirit speaks very clearly. And the Spirit speaks only what God speaks. And God is only speaking now through his word. Right. Even when you get an emotional a word from the Lord, even when you think you get a, a rhema word from the Lord, it ought to line up with his word. Amen. If it does not line up with his word, then God is not speaking. Mm -hmm. When you pray, yes, Brother Clark, you ought to pray without ceasing. You ought to pray continuously. You ought to talk to God all during the day. Don't wait to nighttime because you may not make it to the nighttime. 
pray all day long. Because prayer is not an outward expression. Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 6, when you go into your secret closet, shut the door behind you and pray to God in secret. Now, he's not talking about you getting up, getting out your chair, out your bed, going into a closet. These things you may do, that's left up to you and God. You may have a war room. You make sure you get in your war room early in the morning and talk to God. When Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter six, when he says, go into your secret closet and shut the door, he says two things. Number one, prayer is private. Number two, prayer is powerful. Number three, prayer itself is personal. And because it's private, because it's personal, it becomes powerful. We got to talk to God. If this world, if this body of Christ would just pray, things will shape up. The only reason Coach L.M. Brown, Gentry High School basketball coach, would say it like this. He says, the only reason that planet Earth is still spinning on its axis is because God has left some praying people on planet Earth. Coach Ellen Brown says the only reason the world is still reviving, still spinning, still rotating is because of the praying people of God. Amen. Oh, if men would pray. Amen. Oh, if men would tell God about it. Oh, if men would just call on the Lord, we would have a better place. Amen. We're living in the latter days. We're living in the last days. We're living in a day where men are falling away from the church. Men are falling away from the faith. Men just hate pastors. Men hate men of God. Men hate women of God. Men hate children of God. Innocent children dying because of the hatred. Not just because they hate individuals, they hate God. Jesus says, they're doing it like this. They're persecuting you and prosecuting you, not because they hate you, but because they hate me. They hate God. In the midst of all going on, what we need to do is have a happy Thanksgiving. And we can't have a happy Thanksgiving without being thankful to God. That's right without being saturated in the word of God and without following God's word and praying God's word. Yes, we ought to pray God's word. When we pray, we ought to remind God or tell God or say to God what God has said in his word. So we ought to pray God's word. When we pray God's word, we were pre repeating back to God what God has said. But you can't pray God's word if you're not in God's word. The second thing about prayer, not only should you pray God's word, you should pray over God's word. God, reveal to me what you're saying here today. God, show me in this verse, show me in this pericope, show me in this chapter, show me what I'm about to read, speak to me, tell me the truth in here. And as God shows you, you, you do it. You know, the issue that I have with some preachers, some teachers, some instructors, some advisors, some mentors, is they tell you what to do, but they don't do it themselves. It's a bad thing when a mentor or a teacher or an advisor says, Jesus says for you to be a servant, but the first time they get to serve by way through the church or through mission, they got something else to do and they don't value it. Prayer will fix it. Jesus spent some time in prayer and he is God. He was God, but he kept talking to God. We need to spend time talking to God. Stop talking to the internet. Stop talking to your family members and friends. Stop talking to your neighbors and stop a moment to talk to God. We ought to have Thanksgiving in our hearts. We ought to, to have the word of God on our hearts. And we ought to be saturated in prayer. Amen. That's what Jesus did. He prayed even to the cross. The same Jesus died for you and me. He died on a skull hill called Calvary. 
He gave his life for you and me just so we can pray and get a prayer through because on Calvary, the veil of the temple was, was rent, was torn from top to bottom, an indication that God himself tore it. Now we can come boldly. The King James Version says we can come boldly before the throne of God for ourselves. In other words, we can go to God by way of Jesus for ourselves. You don't need the preacher. You can't wait on your pastor to call on God for you. He prays with you, but not for you. Don't depend on your man of God or your instructor to do all your praying for you. Jesus even prayed. They killed him in the midst of his dying. He stopped long enough to pray, to talk to God and watch God talk to him. He died on Calvary. They laid him in a barber tomb. Early that third day morning, he rose from the dead for you and for me, for our sins. And that same Jesus is available to you tonight. The same Jesus that had thanksgiving, the same Jesus that quoted the word, lived by the word and served by the word, that same Jesus that prayed the word and talked to God himself. He rose early that third day morning with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. And if you are not saved tonight, this is your moment. You can be born again. This is an opportunity for you to be born again. This is an opportunity for you can, to go to heaven. You can take tonight and, and invite Christ into your life. And tomorrow morning, you will have something more to be thankful. You can be thankful for a brand new life. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You can come to Jesus right now. Just bow your head with me and invite him in. Say, Lord Jesus... I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul in Jesus' name. We believe that you're saved. We believe if you honestly prayed this prayer, inviting Christ into your life, believing that he's the son of God, that he died for your sins and rose from the dead. We believe that you're born again and you're on your way to heaven. Now you got to do two things. Number one, three things. Number one, join a good Bible teaching church. I recommend the New Beginning Church. Number two, get in the word of God. Number three, be a servant unto the Lord. And God will be well pleased with you. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church. If you received Christ tonight, inbox us and let us know that you received him so we can rejoice with you and fellowship with you. If you want to join our church, whether you are locally located or globally located, we welcome you to join. We have members who join on distant soil. We welcome you to be a part of the New Beginning Church. Just inbox us and let us know that you want to be a member of this great church in Southeast Houston, Texas, USA. And we'll be thankful unto the Lord. We will saturate you with the word and we will pray for you and pray with you. Thank you so much for joining us. We're lifting all those on our prayer list. We're lifting them before the Lord. Please continue to pray for Reverend Sivaran and his wife, Denise Sivaran. Continue to pray that Sister Denise Sivaran stand again and praise God for, for the great victory. We're praying for Pastor James C. Hicks. We're praying that God raises him up and that God give him a chance to preach the word of God again. Bless his heart and bless his mind. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for those whose names have been called. We thank you for blessing them, Father God. We ask you to, to go with them and stand by them. Raise up Pastor Hicks, Father God. Bless his heart. Bless his mind. Bless his, his physique, Father God. Bless him, Father God, to honor you as he has so many times. We pray, Father God, for Sister Denise Simmerman. We ask you to raise her up, heal her body, and bless her, Father God, to walk for you, to sing for you, 
again and again. Bless her husband, Father God. Give him support. Give him comfort. Give him, Father God, what he needs in times like these. Now, Lord, we thank you for the New Beginning Church. We ask you to bless us that we will be a beacon light in a cold, dark, and dismal world. Bless us, Father God, that we as members, we as faith walkers, will recognize Jesus Christ and glorify his name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to give to the New Beginning Church, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gift, your gift to New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. And as we go tonight, we're praying for my cycling brother, K.Z. Jenkins. He has set the standards for cyclers here in, in the Houston area. We're lifting him before the Lord. Thank you so much for your gifts. Thank you so much for attending. God bless you and God keep you. Father God, we thank you now. We pray for this, our brother, KZ Jenkins Jr. We ask you to heal his body, strengthen him, give him strength and give him hope, Father God. Bless him to be a great example to us once again. Bless him to deacon as before. Bless him, Father God, to ride as before. Bless him, Father God, to encourage men women, boys, and girls as before. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, join me in saying, Amen. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.